Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. We've got a great discussion tonight all about philanthropy, entitled, Does Philanthropy Matter? Uh, or does philanthropy make a difference? Excuse me. It does matter, but does it make a difference? Um, we're really pleased to have uh, tonight's forum a distinguished panel, including a former IOP fellow, Margaret McKenna. So we want to invite her, welcome her back. Uh, but tonight's panel is being moderated by a current IOP uh, form uh, fellow, excuse me, Sonal Shaw, uh, and she's going to introduce the rest of the panel. So enjoy the discussion. Uh, ask plenty of questions on the microphones, and Sonal, Great. thanks. Thanks, Trey. Um, thanks to all of you for coming, and I think this is going to be, you know, we, we all talk about philanthropy and the effectiveness of philanthropy or working in philanthropy, and can philanthropy work with government? Can philanthropy work with the private sector? And what we have is a panel here that uh, of three women who are not one who is studying philanthropy, knows the issues around philanthropy, has run a philanthropy in a corporation. Uh, another two who have run foundations or running significant programs within foundations. And what we hope to have is a robust discussion on the role of philanthropy and what's happening today. And as we hear constantly about the new foundations being created, uh, everything from what Google is doing to the Omidyars to 10 years ago, the Gates Foundation, what are the new philanthropies doing and how is philanthropy, the philanthropic landscape changing? So we'll talk a little bit about everything. I certainly hope you will ask tough questions because it will be a more robust discussion based on the questions that you ask. And I'm going to introduce each of the speakers really quickly and then we'll start with uh, Chris Letts and then we'll uh, have Mimi and then Margaret talk about kind of their roles. They're going to introduce them. They're going to introduce a little bit, five minutes each of their own. Uh, next to me is Chris Letts. She's the interim director of the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations and Rita Hauser, senior lecturer in the practice of philanthropy and nonprofit leadership at, at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, she has extensive experience in both the private, nonprofit, and public management and joined Harvard in 1992 as the executive director of the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations. Um, I can go on and on about her, her background, but just to give a couple of highlights, uh, she was at the Cummins Engine engine company in Columbus, Indiana for 10 years. And she also ran the Cummins Engine Foundation and was vice, vice president of corporate philanthropy there, so uh, and corporate social responsibility. So she's had experience both in the private sector and she worked as the secretary of Indiana's Tra Department of Transportation and later led the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration. So she certainly knows government and she knows, uh, and now she's in academia. So she knows all parts of the sectors and I think it, she'll bring a very interesting perspective. Next to her is Mimi Corcoran, who is at the, uh, she runs a special fund for poverty alleviation at the Open Society Foundations, and has been working with government foundations and community-based organizations as a part of that. And in her background, she's been the executive director of an organization called the Beginning with Children Foundation. She served as a consultant to many foundations and many corporations, and she serves on the board of several nonprofits, educational and youth-related nonprofits. And she's had significant experience at the Open Society Institute and certainly knows a foundation that has uh, been taking risk along the way. And then I'll take next to her is Margaret McKenna. For those of you that don't know her, she was a fellow last semester uh, here at the, Kennedy, at the IOP. And she's a lawyer and an educator and certainly has been in everything from what I can tell. Um, but Margaret's, you know, one of the biggest found corporate foundations in the United States is the Walmart Foundation. And Margaret headed the Walmart Foundation uh, from, for many years before she then came here in, in 2011. From 2007 to 2011, she led the foundation. In fact, I think many will say she was a leading figure within Walmart to transform the way the foundation operates in a large corporation, and many are looking to her in terms of how they might think about it for themselves. Uh, prior to joining Walmart, um, Margaret was the president emeritus professor of leadership at Lesley University. Now, they are the university that's buying up all the other real estate in Cambridge, from what I can tell. But she took, she took Leslie from uh, being a small college to being a university and really leading the growth of the university. So uh, she has not only experience in leading large organizations, but she's also led a foundation and, and will bring a whole uh, series of different discussions around how corporate foundations can actually operate, but also where philanthropy in the corporate sector can, can lead to change. So with that, I'm going to let Chris start, and then we'll, uh, we'll have Mimi and Margaret follow. Okay. Thank you, Sonal. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's a pleasure to be talking about this. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard about Carnegie and Rockefeller. They are the people that tend to be cited when anyone starts a sentence about philanthropy. 
And I want to disabuse the audience that J.D. Rockefeller Jr. and Andrew Carnegie were the only, much less the best models of philanthropy in the early uh, beginnings of philanthropy in this country. The fact that they're cited so frequently is evidence to me that we continue to be more interested in wealth than impact in philanthropy. I want to share several examples of um, philanthropists who had impact, and they happened to be women, and several of them were contemporaries of Carnegie and Rockefeller. Now, this is a quote from a woman who became known as Madam C.J. Walker at the National Negro Business League in 1912. I am a woman who came from the cotton fields of the South. From there, I was promoted to the wash tub. From there, to the cook kitchen. Then I promoted myself into the business of manufacturing hair goods and products. I had built my own factory on my own ground. She was the first woman millionaire and happened to be an African American. In 1911, Madam C.J. Walker had 1,000 sales agents nationwide across the country. They were organized into what she called Walker Clubs, and these clubs were challenged to do the most philanthropically for African Americans in neighborhoods, and the company rewarded those that got the best results. She donated generously to the NAACP anti-lynching campaign after President Wilson refused to meet with her. She was an early and important supporter of the YMCA in Indianapolis. A decade later, not John D. Rockefeller, but his wife Abby, was quietly changing the way art was seen and access to it in America. Over the objection of her husband, she strove to change America's view of art. She embraced, um, she moved from the old masters to embracing living artists, both in the United States and abroad. And in the face of an elite to which she belonged, who really disdained this, this art. I mean, this is Picasso and people like that in, um, at that stage. Then she used her allowance from her husband, $25,000, which was a lot at the time, and space in one of his buildings for which she paid rent to him to start the institution we now know as the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And while she had a powerful gang of women supporters behind her, she had to use one of her associates, who was a man, to be the visible face of the organization so it would not face the kind of um, uh, objection that she anticipated. OK, person three, Olivia Slocum was married to a man named Russell Sage, who was a ruthless businessman, who in 1902 said that great wealth was not a problem for society, but that it actually guaranteed the safety of society as long as it remained in the right hands. Upon his death in 1907, perhaps to defy him or maybe to redeem him, Olivia founded and named a foundation after him. The Russell Sage Foundation was then, and continues to be, the leader in funding research for the improvement of social and living conditions in the US, the cause that Olivia was supporting all her life. Finally, we move a little bit more toward the end of the century. Betty Noyce began her philanthropy in 1973 after she divorced her husband, who was one of the two founders of Intel. Frustrated by a lack of identity um, and opportunities both in her marriage and in California, she moved to Maine where they had summered most of their life. And once there, she not only provided the gifts and grants that are the usual in philanthropy, but she used her wealth to back major economic development initiatives in Maine. She founded a bank so that there would be a Maine-based bank um, instead of just banks from outside. She bought the Nissan Baking Company um, so that it wouldn't, it wouldn't leave Maine. Um, she funded heavily um, investment in the Old Port in Portland, for any of you who have been there, that revitalized the downtown. And until her death, she continued to invest in innovative economic development opportunities way before this thing we called impact investing um, came to be in vogue. 
Now, none of these women chose to put their name on their legacies, um, but all of them showed amazing social entrepreneurship, will, and skill, despite uh, pretty constraining circumstances having to do with their birth, their race, their gender, and society. Pretty remarkable. It's great to be here. Thanks, Sonal. It's good to be with old friends and to see new friends. And I see an old friend over there. Um, for the past three years, I've had the great privilege of working for Open Society Foundations, uh, which was founded by George Soros in the early or late 1970s, early 80s. Uh, my first tour of duty, I served in Central Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union, building non-governmental organizations overseas. Um, George Soros is probably one of the greatest risk takers, both as, uh, from a financial perspective in his hedge fund, as well in his, in his own philanthropy. We were working on the ground in Sarajevo when the guns were shooting, and we put in and invested in a pipeline for water so that people wouldn't be killed as they went to get their water during the day. Um, I left the foundation and then came back and was asked by Mr. Soros um, to oversee a time-limited fund called the Special Fund for Poverty Alleviation in uh, 2009. And it was really a fund that he wanted to set up to address the devastating impact of the economic crisis of people living in poverty in the United States. It was a point in time when most organizations, philanthropies, most of the corpus was really devastated by the financial collapse. Governments were in retrenchment, trying, struggling to do more with less. And really, businesses were paralyzed. And everybody was kind of hunkering down. And all of a sudden, George had this great idea. Let's do a fund. Let's create a fund and help stem the impact of this crisis on low-income people in the United States. So in doing that, our first focus was on humanitarian aid. And we brought in a whole group of experts to think about this. And we really decided at that point in time that the smartest move was to align ourselves with the stimulus funds of the federal government. And that that was going to be a very strategic way to infuse uh, resources into our very devastated economy. So to do that, we decided we were going to tap the Temporary Assistance for Needy Family Emergency Contingency Fund, which was a $5 billion fund that the Obama administration had put forth that really was dealing with really very low-income individuals. And as part of that fund, there was a one-time cash assistance component to it. So because uh, of a very personal experience Mr. Soros had when he was at the London School of Economics. He was waiting tables and really struggling to pay his way. Um, it, his tutor actually uh, saw how tired he was and reached out to the Quakers who offered him 40 pounds, no strings attached. So as part of the project for this humanitarian piece, we decided that we would do a $200 um, cash assistance uh, back to school uh, package for people on public assistance and food stamps in the state of New York. We negotiated with uh, the then governor to be able to actually give a private donation to government of $35 million, which would leverage $140 million in stimulus dollars. Uh, we took hits from the from the right that said those people should be told how to spend the money because we did, we did what Mr. Soros wanted, no strings attached. We actually, it made me a little nervous, uh, we actually worked with a lot of economists to be assured that 98% of the time when funds are put for children, the funds get spent for children. And we weren't concerned that they were for school supplies or books, but we really said it's okay if a person pays their rent because we know statistically that if a child moves three times in a year, they will not go on to the next grade at grade level. So that was, you know, fine by us. We took hits from the left that said that wasn't very long-term or strategic, and we said what part of humanitarian aid did you not get? But um, so uh, as the crisis to evolve, though, Mr. Soros, I saw that we, on the phone you get to see in our offices who's calling you, so beware. Um, so I saw Soros Fund Management, and I thought, oh, gosh, he's thinking again. And he goes, Mimi, Mimi, I've been thinking. I said, oh. 
And he said, yes, I, I think the crisis is an inverted square root. And, and, and being a finance major in public policy, I was like drawing frantically what an inverted square root <laughs> looks like. And it looks like that for all of you. And so he really thought it was going to be deep and long. And he asked if I would redo our strategy focused on direct services. So I brought a team of experts back together to say, how could we go about approaching this? And how can we really be influential and catalytic at a time of crisis? And so to help move people from, from uh, deep poverty, we said, all right, let's look at three programmatic areas, benefits access, education, and workforce. If we tap the social safety net differently, using partners along the way to stabilize the lives of low-income people, we can then invest in programs in education and workforce to development to move them from the public economy to the private economy. And that's just what we did. We also knew that as a time-limited fund, we really we had to be very concerned about a cliff effect, that we didn't want this infusion of resources to cause our grantees to kind of fall off a cliff when our money was no longer there. So we really knew that we needed partnerships. So we did some very innovative things. Leverage, kind of, we had three strategies. One was about leverage, another was about uh, taking a comprehensive approach and the third was really looking at sustainability and policies. We wanted really to impact the lives of low-income individuals, demonstrate more effective approaches to serve those in need, and use those lessons to reform the systems and policies that we had in place. We also knew, I'm so nice, going to get the hook soon, I think. <laughs> we also knew that um, systems reform is very hard, and it's not a short-term process, and you really need to be in it in the long haul. And I think sometimes foundations um, tend to be, as a colleague of mine from another foundation said in a presentation, fickle. We're in for what seems like a really great thing. We go in and we get out. Um, so our strategy really looked at building these partnerships, and partnerships not only for funding, but partnerships for intellectual capital, partnership for capacity of organizations. We really tapped the federal government. There were a lot of innovation funds. I think this will be a very long legacy that the Obama mm -hmm. administration has really led, um, and it's been a great privilege. That's how I actually met Sonal Shaw, uh, Shaw looking at the Social Innovation Fund. Um, where we would use the federal government, they would entice others to come in in partnerships, and then we would support intermediaries that, that would then go on down into localities. Our focus was on disconnected youth and building workforce career pathways for low-income individuals. Um, sustainability was always key at the beginning for us. We really, knowing that it was a short-term fund, we wanted to make sure that we negotiated with our partners. Sometimes we would be the first in, and the partners then would take us out as we went along the way. Um, and we also knew that um, too often, I think, we look at issues from a single focus. And so our three focal points, our focal areas of benefits access, education, workforce, we really wanted to look at them together. So if we led with benefits access, for instance, on community college campuses, 75% of the students are non-traditional. They're working. Most of them have families while they're trying to get an education. So they're dealing with housing issues, child care issues, transportation issues. So what we did is work with uh, states around the country to actually test out if we create a new kind of financial aid for low-income people on community college campuses that use Pell Grants um, and loans as well as benefits, will we get a persistence in outcomes that we're looking for? Um, so I think one of the things that we've learned in this short-term fund is there are opportunities for philanthropy to be catalytic, to actually seed innovation, to take advantage of uh, a downturn and transform it into positive things to actually change the narrative. People were much more willing to partner with us because they didn't have the resources and actually were trying to solve and come up with new solutions. Okay, and, and I know when I was at the Walmart Foundation, we were given the opportunity to partner with you, uh, but we said no. But. We were probably wrong. But I don't hold it against you. <laughs> so uh, for 40 years, I spent my life in the nonprofit and government sector. So uh, over 60, I decided to move into the for-profit sector. As a civil rights lawyer, choosing Walmart to go into was a surprise <laughs> to some people. 
uh, and uh, was a question in my own mind. Could, could running a corporate foundation, would we have an impact? Because when I got there, there was really no there there. It was an old-fashioned corporate foundation, of which there are still a lot of them around, which means that the vice president of the company calls up and says, write a check to the University of Missouri Law School. And that's what happened. So uh, when I got there, that was what's happening. It was happening, and I didn't know whether or not that could change. But it changed very dramatically. And uh, maybe one of the reasons is Walmart's such a big company that giving away $900 million wasn't that much money a year. So we, we got to do dramatic change. And, um, and, and, and we started to think about, as a foundation, and working with a lot of others. One of the things we thought about was partnerships. We partnered with other foundations, uh, and we partnered with for-profits as well. And to give you an example, um, one of the major issues that we took on was hunger. Because if you're in a corporate foundation, you should think about what is the company about. Walmart's the largest grocer in the United States. So you want to fit with who you are, and you have to think about who are the customers and who are the employees. And really working class folks, uh, you know, on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale uh, was our interest. So I proposed hunger as our signature program. And, and just to give you an idea, the ripple effect you can have that way is when I got there, the company was not giving away any food. It was throwing away all the food. It's now the largest donor of food in the United States. If you take all the other retail fooders, grocers together, Walmart is still bigger in terms of donating food. And as a result of that, we, you know, we did school breakfast everywhere, and, um, and, and it, it will be sustainable forever. It's one of the things I love about it is, is that, talk about a sustainable program, is the corporation will now give away food forever. We provided, the foundation provided refrigerator trucks for every major food bank in the country to pick up the food uh, because there was such an influx of food. And it happened at the same time Mimi's talking about during the economic downturn when there was such a demand on food banks uh, that Walmart really made a huge difference this way at the right timing. And, and I think the, the, you know, people often ask me, when I was the head of the Walmart Foundation and very popular, not very popular anymore. But uh, the first thing they would ask me is, how do I get the money? And uh, the second thing they would ask is, how do you make the choice between what's right for the company and what's good, has impact? And I said, I never made that choice. There is so much need out there that you can always do something impactful that fits the company, if you think that way. If you think first impact, and then you think there's all, you know, you can do housing, you can do food, you can do workforce, you can do education, what fits with who we are? So I'm, I never had to make that decision, and I would argue that no corporate foundation has to make that decision if they think, as you've heard today, that you think about impact. Um, and I, I also think that, that a lot of corporate foundations and some private foundations used to do charity. And there is a difference between charity and philanthropy. There's also a difference between philanthropy and what we'll talk about, I'm sure, is social investment. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I do think that the world has moved toward the social investment, impact investing, investment, investing uh, world. And I do think there needs to be some balance, because there are some things that will always need contribution. They are not sustainable on their own. They just won't happen. There are circumstances, though, and I think this is where it's become important. I'll give you an example in terms of a business model that does work. We were one of the large founders of, uh, funders of Youth Build. Youth Build, I don't know you know about it. It's all over the country. You basically take kids who have dropped out. They get a high school diploma or a GAD. They go to work, a school for a week, and then they work for a week. And uh, we, you know, we probably gave them $20 million over the four years I was there. And, but we also asked them, because mostly what they do is green construction, so energy saving, which was another piece that Walmart was doing. 
And so I suggested to them, why don't they, we gave them money specifically to think about creating a company that would do uh, environmental uh, assessments and retrofit for houses. So it would give their graduates some place to work, plus it would be in income because it would be a subsidiary for youth build. I mean, there are possibilities there that oftentimes nonprofits, because of the sort of philosophy they've come out of, don't think about. But I also caution that, that there are nonprofits, as we know them, that cannot sustain themselves, that will always need a foundation and private philanthropy support. And, and, they're, and uh, there are basically people who, and I think all of us talk about in Sonel too, is you know, our goal and my goal at Walmart is, and still is at Walmart, because they just sent me something the other day, is to take people who are marginalized economically and give them the opportunity to lead sustained, dignified lives. So with the education, the job training, and the opportunities that allow them to do that. And I think, you know, in some ways that is an investment because they come from depending on support to in fact being contributing members of society and what I used to argue at Walmart and customers. Right? I mean, the more, and, and I had international as well as domestic uh, giving, and uh, yeah, that's when I used to, the more we can do in uh, developing countries, the more customers there will be uh, for goods. So it is a loop. It can be a real loop. Uh, and you can argue, I think, that, that altruism is good, but economics also can work in terms of good, thoughtful, impactful, Philanthropy, and I must say, I will say that I think a huge amount of philanthropy has been wasted, a huge amount, because it has not been thoughtful in terms of what the impact is and how it's going to affect people's lives longer term, as well as the people who need it right now. But can we, you know, it's the fishing rod rather than the fish. Sometimes we need to do the fish and the fishing rod, <laughs> uh, but we need to think about the fishing rod in a dignified way as well. Well, so we now have uh, great points and certainly very different points that have been made here. And I'm going to ask each of them a question, but I certainly hope all of you are getting ready to ask questions because there's a wealth of conversation we can have on this. And I'm just going to start leading off with some of the questions. So l let me just start with you, Mimi, as a, as a, as a point. You know, in many ways in this, in this political um, climate, the one conversation that has, has not happened is poverty. Um, there's been no conversation around poverty. It's been about middle class. It's been about middle class growth. But in, and what you saw and what we saw in the 2008 crisis was an increase in poverty, yet poverty is not a point of conversation uh, today. And the fund that you have is a limited time fund, but we could argue that poverty actually has increased and the income inequality is also continuing to increase. So just kind of where does the role of philanthropy in catalyzing some of this and where have where is there an opportunity to do more, but there isn't stuff happening? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think the question that poverty hasn't been a part of this discussion at a national level is um, egregious. Uh, 46 million people on food stamps, uh, unemployment at record rates. You know, we talk about an 8% unemployment rate, but when you go into Detroit, or other communities, tribal communities, the unemployment rate is staggering. We're looking at 25% um, at best. Unemployment with youth is uh, monumental. We have 6.7 million youth that are neither in work or in education. Um, we have a crisis. And um, I do think it's incumbent upon us to, as philanthropists, to think of innovative, innovative ways of kind of raising up and changing the narrative, um, we all participate in the social safety net, whether we want to say it or not. Um, we tend to demonize those who are low income, that they shouldn't be on food stamps, that they shouldn't be receiving housing, you know, that they really could just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. The reality is we all need a little help and a hand up once in a while. And so some of the things I think philanthropy can do is to really change that narrative and have a more robust dialogue about 
What is this social safety net that we have? We have mortgage tax credits. We have, um, you know, so you have this kind of fight between the middle class and low income individuals. We're all in this together. So I think that's one of the things that I would urge us is to how do you actually convene politicians to have, how do you, we only have, we have limited resources here. And how do we set our priorities? And a nation that doesn't set its priority to help the most vulnerable isn't a nation that we should be proud of. Um, sorry, that's something I really believe in my soul. Um, I think there are other things that you can do by helping states become more efficient. We worked on a, um, a workforce support strategy with um, about six states in the country, North Carolina, South Carolina, Illinois, Idaho, Rhode Island, and Colorado, a very mix of both blue and red states. Um, and in looking at those states, we really said, how can we help government be more efficient and effective? How can we help them change their technology of legacy systems? How can we help them have better business operations? And in that way, shift resources so that they could be more client oriented and really provide services more effectively. So I think philanthropy can partner with government to actually help government work better. Um, yeah, great. And we'll, we'll certainly have more on that. Um, Margaret, you talked a lot about impact and kind of how to have impact. And I guess the question I have is one of the conversations, and certainly we had in government, and I know we've had this before, but is, is philanthropy having an impact? I mean, is, it, is a lot of money just going to the same organizations over and over again? I mean, this is kind of the conversation of the social entrepreneurship, right. social innovation. Are we funding those things that have potential to actually help solve problems or help at least address some of these problems? Or one could argue that the poverty is increasing, but how come it's not decreasing? Yeah, I, I, first, I don't think these problems can be solved by philanthropy. It's philanthropy, the corporate world, and government. And we don't, haven't been able to do that very well. Um, and I do think there are examples of philanthropy making a big difference. And the one I point to all the time is health in terms of drugs, development, and research, a lot of it funded by uh, philanthropy and certainly by government. And we've seen an, an amazing, not access to affordable care. I don't mean that kind of help. I mean, uh, you know, the advances in medicine uh, in, in terms of major disease. Um, I, I do think that uh, we've seen examples of philanthropy changing the horizon. One example is charter schools. Charter schools came as a result of philanthropy of actually the Walton family, the founders of Walmart, were the, are the largest donors and the first donors of charter schools in the country. And it has, it's, one, it's an interesting example because I'm not a huge charter school supporter. I think they have a place, but they only deal with 5% of the kids in the country, but it's all we hear about. So I'm much more interested in the other 95% of the kids in the country who are not in charter schools. But, it, but uh, it is an example of a philanthropist who believed in private education, private education really, and, and uh, control by citizens, which is, that's a good thing, uh, who changed the face, actually, is changing the face of, of uh, public education. The theory being that the charter schools would develop innovation, the innovation would move to the, to the other public schools, which hasn't happened. But it is an example of how it's worked. That's great. And Chris, we talked about a little bit this, about this before, but we hear about these new foundations being developed, seems all on a regular basis. I worked at one Google. Um, there's new wealth creation, which is actually putting a lot more people into, the, into wanting to give. You hear about the giving pledge, the billionaires giving uh, you know, 50% of their wealth to philanthropy. Have the numbers changed? I mean, has philanthropy actually increased over time, or is this a perception? Uh, the, the, the bad news is that it hasn't as a, as a percent of personal income. Um, it's remained stubbornly at 2% uh, or less. Uh, and in recent years, in the last 10 years, it's actually gone down um, from historic highs back in the 1960s. Um, what's more troubling is that um, 
the numbers of families, and uh, the numbers of family of uh, households worth more than one million dollars, excluding primary residents, um, was 3.5 million in 1994. In 2000, there were 8.3 million households worth more than one million dollars. Now the, the problem was is that again private giving didn't go up commensurate with that accumulation of wealth. Um, and then back to the poverty issue, I mean philanthropists through the years have not liked poor people. Um, I mean there's there's a whole lot of history that just continues to today of um, of people disdaining. Uh, poor people, rich people disdaining poor people, and they want to give to things that allow the self-help and all of that and, and all that kind of thing. And um, I think there, there are some new models. Um, the, the problem is, again, the media and a lot of people pay more attention to the initial accumulation of wealth and the announcement of doing something rather than following up to see whether anything is done and helping to hold them accountable. So I think that's one problem. But the principles, I think, of having impact are the same. And whether they you know, create something new, if there aren't fundamental things about adaptability, learning, sustainability, sticking with something, you know, learn, you know, do, act, correct, Go back in and reinvest, and you know, use your learning and and things like that. Those are real fundamental things that have to do with impact. And I see new philanthropies and old philanthropies not adhering to some of those basic principles, which doesn't doesn't give me a, a lot of hope. Questions? Do people have questions? Please feel free to come up to one of the mics and ask a question if you have any. And if you don't mind, just quickly stating your name and um, asking your question. Start here. Hi, I'm Jason Dillon. I'm a master's student in the Ed School, Technology Innovation Education. Um, I'm hearing, um, I like what I'm hearing very much, and I want to congratulate all three of you for your efforts. Um, but I'm going to ask a question that I hope doesn't sound too critical. Um, one is, that I hear what you're saying about, uh, for example, with the Walmart example where you say, that you want to have a, a mission as a foundation that lines up with the company. And I wonder if that conversation is going the other way and saying we have these corporate foundations and powerful actors that are philanthropic and they're contributing to an ecosystem and if we're trying to have maximum impact, do they have some levers in this ecosystem to alleviate conditions of poverty and hunger? Take for example, um, part-time employees and healthcare and rather than saying, you know, I understand they're working on a grand scale to say we're going to give full-time benefits and health care to all of our employees. Maybe that's not an option for Walmart, but what about saying, hey, there was a big health care debate a couple years ago, and they've got some leverage in the corporate community and the political community. Could they have gotten behind single payer um, and really help the hunger issue? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Walmart question. And I don't, I don't, I don't mean to, to focus no, no, in on no, Walmart. No, no. It's okay. I, the, it's a good the, question. the dynamic is what I I'm interested in. Five yeah. years. It's, it's the right good question. Uh, you know, I'm a progressive who went to work for Walmart. Mm -hmm. And before I went, I asked a lot of questions about salary and benefits. And what I can tell you is, you know, you don't want to work for one of the big box stores. But uh, if you can help it, you know, if you can get the education and the workforce training, you, you know. But to tell you the truth, and, and I have not drunk the Kool-Aid here, because I can tell you, Walmart's salary and benefits are as good, or most cases, better than anybody else's in terms of even the work, the full-time, part-time people. Now, over the last, when I got there, they had just changed the benefits, and after I left, it has all to do with me, I'm sure, they changed them back in, in terms of what mm. was happening with the economy. Uh, one of the things, in terms of having more part-time people, less full-time people, because uh, they were, in fact, uh, 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 struggling some in terms of state store sales. I think that you're absolutely right that when Walmart sneezes, you know, everybody in the world feels it. So they decided to do something about the environment. They changed the world, I, literally. They got all their vendors, they brought in all their vendors and they said, cut your packaging by a third. 
and you've got five years to do it. We can't tell you to do that, but if you don't do it, we won't buy from you. They brought in all the vendors and they said, cut sugar and salt out of your food. You don't do it, we won't buy from you. So incredibly powerful. Could Walmart change the economy? And I think the answer is yes, in terms of educating their employees, in terms of finding a way to balance the profit margins with the salary and benefits. Now, I'm not an economist or running a company, though some people at Walmart thought that I thought I was running the company sometimes. But I do think it's an incredible, powerful thing that a lot of companies have not thought about their place that way. Hi, good evening. My name is Laura Lynn, and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Um, I have a question for Ms. McKenna. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for being here, and I have a question for Ms. McKenna um, on behalf of the committee. Um, we've seen how your leadership at Walmart has been, or has brought about a huge success in terms of growing the corporation and um, achieving uh, different visions. Um, I'd just like to know what is the, what do you think has been the, the greatest driving force in achieving social impact? Well, I think there's no question the greatest driving force has been the, uh, the commitment to, to hunger relief and nutrition. So, you know, in the four years I was there, Walmart went from, uh, you know, as I said, not giving away food to giving away food to being the largest owner of protein, the largest owner of fresh food, and the largest seller of organic food. And now, you know, there's this incredible difficult balance between food deserts, as we call them, right? Mm -hmm which are in lower income neighborhoods, like Washington DC in the Southeast. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no supermarkets. So, it, you know, you, you're, you make the decision here. Do you want a Walmart there who will have healthy food at very reasonable prices or not because you think the jobs aren't good enough? Is a job better than no job? This is not an easy answer. So I, 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 I do think that, uh, as we said before, they can make an enormous difference. And I think, I think part of it is thinking about government, like Mayor Menino, who wouldn't let the Walmart come into Boston, uh, negotiating deals on salary and benefits with the company. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Sarah. I'm a freshman at the college, and this is a question for Margaret McKenna, but really any of you if you have any thoughts on it. I was just wondering to what extent you think uh, large businesses or corporations like Walmart can afford not to have a degree of um, social responsibility. Do you think customers are very responsive to the fact that you have a charity like you've built? Uh, the answer is no. Now, that's going to be shocking to you, but I made the argument inside the company that if we were more socially responsible, the company was more socially responsible, and we gave more impactful philanthropy, that it would do a couple things, raise the reputation of the company, make the employees proud to work there, and raise the number of people who shopped in Walmart and bought in Walmart. The president of Walmart US does not believe, and he has some data to back it up, that the reputation did rise, not a lot, because there's been a long history, and employees are ecstatic about the hunger stuff because they load the food trucks, trucks but they don't sell more widgets. I, I, just, I think um, there's a great paper out of Davos uh, by Credit Suisse that talks about kind of the restructuring of all the different sectors, that the sectors are broken. And so how do we look at it? And I think internationally it's a little easier when you have governments that can't provide the infrastructure in place where the private sector takes on what would be, a, for us in the United States, a very different and unusual role. For instance, providing water delivery at a lower cost than the government can provide and actually makes a profit on it. Um, and I think I think we have to be prepared to look at each sector differently and what are the roles and responsibilities. For instance, um, there's an organization not dissimilar to youth build called Year Up, where they build these partnerships for first typically first generation uh, kids going to college. 
um, with financial institutions. And we're now trying to push the financial institutions to actually pay for those apprenticeships. Um, they get a stipend for it, but we would like that to be kind of a, a, a matter of course, that the financial institutions think of frontline workers, not middle-line workers, as worthy of professional development. So I think we have to kind of be very innovative and take risk, and that's a risk. That's a risk for a corporation to invest in those frontline workers like that. And like summer jobs, summer jobs for 16 to 20 year olds in particular, right. which are a real step. There's a lot of research that shows if you've had a summer job, that you're more likely to finish school and you're more likely to have a, 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 a better job. And companies who pay for kids in school or out of school to work will make a big difference in their lives. I think it's, it's, it's not really the customers, it's the institutional investors that are demanding short-term profitability that are the enemy of, of corporations wanting to take risks and sticking their neck out and doing more than the minimum in terms of, of philanthropy. Um, and, and so that's where, that's where we have to turn some attention. And we are, the Institute for Responsible Investment here is doing a lot of work with trustees of pension funds on beginning to think about impact investing, but beginning to try to help them understand um, how to put a social lens on all the investing they do. Um, and that's, that's just beginning, but, but that's the, those, those, those big institutions um, who look kind of blindly at the market and are trying to figure out how to make the biggest bang for their buck that are the issues there. Oh, right here, sorry. Hi, my name's Jesus, I'm a second year uh, student here at the Kennedy School. Um, what I was wondering is, given that it seems like the Democrats are, are presuming that low-income people are in their base, and that Republicans are sort of presuming that high-income people, for the most part, are in their base, and most of the conversation, of course, like during a campaign, ends up in the middle, what role do you see philanthropies taking in sort of changing the political dialogue to, to speak more about poverty, um, if any role at all? George is trying to do that. Yes, George is trying to do that. Um, yeah, you know, I think uh, you have, uh, I, I think this is an issue for our country, whether it's the Koch brothers, whether it's Soros, whether it's Pope. Um, you have the issue of large PACs. They're actually taking the voice of what I believe is our citizenship. Um, and, you know, I don't think then it's really a dialogue of uh, the rich versus the poor, but it's a, it's a very different dialogue of money influencing um, results. Um, you know, and so I would urge all of you to take back our government. Um, that's a non-Soros, non that's a Mimi Corcoran uh, piece. But I think, um, I, I, I think it's just, I don't think either of them, I think Sonal said it correctly, I don't think anybody is really talking about the low income, and I just think that has to become a dialogue. I think we have a responsibility to, to engage in that conversation. Right, but do, do you think philanthropies have a role in, in sort of in, in forming the dialogue and shaping it? Surely, putting, I mean. Putting it on the stage, perhaps? I mean, we have. I mean, with the Poverty Alleviation Fund, we really have pushed other funders to really look at, let's take the formerly incarcerated. Nobody wants to talk about them. National funders want to talk about community rebuilding. But then you actually ask them, well, do you know who comes back into the community for many of us? Is those have been formally incarcerated. So then you need to be talking about that issue in our country. You need to be talking about mass incarceration. Philanthropists really don't want to talk about mass incarceration and what that says about our biases in this country. They don't really want to talk about drug laws. Um, George has been absolutely instrumental in drug laws and really looking at, you know, dealing with addiction issues as, as a medical issue, not as a, a, as a reason to incarcerate people. Now, there are extremes. There are things that we have to be concerned about, about social or societal safety. But then let's put it out. If you have money to actually deal with your son or daughter that... Um, maybe had, you know, was smoking a joint, but you happen to come from the wrong zip code, 
and you don't have those resources, your outcome is going to be very different. And then your life trajectory, when you have to check that box when you're trying to get a job, is going to be different. So at Soros, that's been a, a huge, huge part of our philanthropy and advocacy work. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's, an interesting, there's an interesting conflict in philanthropy and influencing government. Um, when, when somebody puts a big load of money into a foundation or a you know, charitable gift fund or something like that, they get all of their tax deduction. And if they can't even take it all, then it gets spread out through, through several years. That money does not go into the world. What we know is that it's not going to the government. And so, I mean, wealthy people spend a lot of money to figure out how not to give any money to the government. You know, this is the debate about what percent of, right. Of, right. of taxes Romney pays versus the, you know, average middle class and, and some things like that. And I think those are some of the debates that we ought to be having um, because there's a boatload of money that's in parking lots, right, that is not, is not particularly getting out. And it's tax avoidance even. I mean, so, I mean, it's just interesting to think about, I mean, if we revise some of our tax rules, we'd actually, people would end up supporting government more. They might feel a little more committed to doing something. I just want to add, I think there's an incredible disdain in this country, as you said, Mimi, for, for poor people, and Chris said, uh, that, you know, and I think there's one party, you can guess which one, who I think has, has really said, you know, there are four, I, you never guess the party, but there are 47% of the people in the country who, uh, you know, really are taking from the government, not giving back. And, and you, when you start thinking about the world that way, is sort of half of you are this way and half of you are that way, it's really problematic. The other thing I would add to what Chris said, which I think is you want to know how to fix corporations, get investors to say, don't eliminate formerly incarcerated people from potential applicants. Most companies just say, you've been incarcerated, mm -hmm. it's over. And those folks have no place to go. Thank you. Question up there. Good evening, my name is Juan Salazar. I'm a uh, first year policy student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, so my question is for Ms. McKenna and Ms. Uh, Corcoran. Uh, I'm, I actually previously worked as a program manager for a workforce de development uh, intermediary. Uh, so my, my question for you is my organization primarily focused on connecting underprivileged uh, youth and folks from uh, those communities to go into high wage and high growth jobs. Uh, one of the challenges that we had as an organization was um, a lot of the training came through community colleges and beyond that, a lot of the funds were actually more focused on programs that were had short term uh, deliverables. Uh, I know Youth Build was sort of mentioned. So one of the challenges that we had was trying to find funding from uh, organizations or foundations that were more inclined to go ahead and fund programs that were looking at, let's say, uh, creating a pathway program for engineering that you didn't see deliverables to about four years out. So to what extent are uh, foundations that are interested in education um, uh, more or less shifting or staying within that scope of uh, looking at short-term deliverables rather than long-term mm -hmm. deliverables? We actually, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, we actually, with several other funders, have launched with Jobs for the Future a program called Accelerating Opportunities, which is working on community college campuses to create what we call, and then you get into foundation speak, contextualized learning for low-skilled learners to actually contextualize their work within a career path. So we have multiple career paths and are really looking at certification along the way so that they have periods because we know life isn't this straight line. I don't know about yours, but mine sure was never a straight line. Um, so to really look at the times that they could get a 12-week certification and be a certified nursing assistant and then use that to go on to an LPN and then on to an RN or a phlebotomist and looking at those kinds, then also looking at the manufacturing sector. So we're working in eight states. Uh, with the state uh, boards of education and through an intermediary called Jobs for the Future, which provides coaching and training to help the community colleges actually work with the professors on the campus as well as um, basic skills uh, uh, teachers to kind of put the pieces together to help uh, low-income individuals, low-level literacy individuals be successful. 
Yeah, I, I think one of the most difficult things has been to find very successful workforce programs. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that they have, I think now there's much more concentration on what Mimi says is, is, is in terms of pathways. So you want programs that are not that long, but that then follow people after they're in a job to support them and make sure the job has opportunities for growth. There's a program here in Boston that follows people for four years after they leave the workforce program and continually upgrades their training and ensures that they're thinking about, you know, higher, better jobs. There are very few programs that do that. There, you know, most of the programs are, we train 500 people. Did they get jobs? Are they still in the jobs? Did they get promoted? You know, I mean, those are the questions we need to ask about workforce programs. And on that, I mean, one of the things that we're putting in all, every grant that we have given it requires um, some kind of evaluation to be done, all the way to the gold standard of randomized control trial to kind of performance um, uh, standards. And I think that body of evidence um, will help us as we go along to say, this works, and to honestly put the mirror to our face as philanthropists and say, you know, gosh, we really thought that was going to be a great bet, but it really didn't work. And one of the things we don't do well in philanthropy is talk about what doesn't work. Right? We like to herald everything that's great, but not say, gosh, don't invest there anymore. You know, I should call Margaret up and say, Margaret, that was a real bust. You know, don't go there. You know, and these were the reason why I'll send you the report. Go someplace else. The other thing is we invested with the federal government um, with Health and Human Services on career pathways. There was, and this is interesting because it spanned, uh, this piece went from two administrations. It was, um, money had been given for randomized control trial out of the Bush administration and it really had languished there because they didn't have enough money to actually invest in the programs to help them scale up and test the ideas. So working with Acting Secretary uh, uh, David Hansel at the time, I said to him, I said, well, what if we came in with an investment with Apt Associates, who was going to actually run the randomized control trials, and we provided the money to fund these career pathways. And some of them are on community college campuses, and some of them, like Carreras on Salud, are, are in communities, and that happens to be in Chicago, to see if we could, you know, test out these different programs and create this additional body of evidence. So that was a great way to actually leverage from one administration to another and actually, you know, and I think work with the federal government to, uh, to kind of say, okay, and in that, if we do this, what kinds of things need to change from Health and Human Services to make them successful? What additional supports can you put in? So for instance, on, on our subsidized employment, where it's really about rapid attachment to work, not necessarily moving a career. If we change the balance between work and education, will we get better outcomes? And can, in our policies, we provide that flexibility? So some of, those are some of the things that we wanted to push hard on. Uh, good evening, thank you. Um, this is a great conversation. I'm Sushma Rahman, and I'm in the mid-career program at the Kennedy School. And uh, my question for you was around accountability. Um, as you know, foundations and corporations have billions in assets and uh, give away hundreds of millions and billions. So um, what are your perspectives and your institution's perspectives on the issues of accountability and transparency? Um, do you have a formalized approach to that issue? Um, I know this is a, a topic of great concern to both elected officials and uh, many in the nonprofit community. Well, I, I think this is a big movement toward accountability. We would all agree. Evidence-based outcomes, assessments, evaluations that show that there is an impact. Uh, I think that that, uh, uh, that almost every foundation has, even corporate foundations, have moved toward an evidence-based impact. And I think that's the right thing. We want to be accountable. You definitely want to be transparent. Uh, my only question about it is, that the assessments that some foundations and people are asking for are so expensive that small, innovative uh, innovation in terms of uh, organizations have a difficult time doing it. So one of the things okay. I think foundations need to do 
is to invest in the capacity of people to do that. So we don't just leave it to the, you know, the, the very large uh, organizations uh, who have the capacity to do that kind of evaluation. That's it. We need some kind of balance there. I think that, that um, I mean, the foundations are beginning to get with the program and being more transparent. E even the Gates Foundation, just which is the most opaque thing, largest opaque thing ever. Um, they've just launched a big initiative um, that they have a brand on that's, that's opening, opening their, their books and all that kind of thing. I, I think that just transparency doesn't get to it, though. I mean, if they don't talk to people, if they're not penetrable, I mean, in terms of dialogue about what they're doing, then the transparency, they get credit for people seeing what they do, but if they're not willing to be influenced, then that doesn't go very far in terms of, in terms of actually improving and, and being part of the mix and allowing themselves to be part of a larger dialogue and, and be adaptive. So I, I think we have to just get beyond the, you know, open your books and let us see things and, 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 and all of that. I mean, I'd like them to talk to each other. I'd like them to be talking to the public, talking to the government, um, just engaging with the community more. That's where, that's where the accountability lies. If they show up and have these conversations face to face, then that's, that's where real accountability, I think, lies. Um, my name is Melissa Mazio. I work in fundraising for a um, global health organization. Uh, my question is about a point that Ms. McKenna made, but it's for all of you. Um, you mentioned that the landscape is shifting from philanthropy towards social investment. And I was just wondering um, what your thoughts were on how organizations like mine who rely traditionally on philanthropy to kind of tap into that world of social investment and find partners rather than just donors. You are the best. Great. Go, Go ahead. I'll, I'll you are the best <laughs> person to answer that. Go ahead. You have a perspective on it, and then I'll, I'll, I'm happy to answer. I, I think it is the, the, it, for some piece, it's the right thing to do. There are some organizations, that, as I think we all yeah. agree, that need uh, philanthropy. They're not going to be able to sustain themselves. Uh, I, and, and I do think there are ways, and someone knows this better than any of us, is uh, in terms of venture philanthropy, and there's all sorts of definitions of it. Right. You know, I give you money, and instead of getting, you know, 1% that I could get, I only get 0.25% back or I just get my money back, or I get part of it back. There's all sorts of different kinds of things, and everybody who says it has a different definition of what it means. So I think it is a movement, and I think a lot of people are thinking, thinking we should move this way, but I'd like to spend a little more time thinking about what it is, how it works, before we all move to, to, uh, to doing this kind of investment philanthropy. I'd say that I think, I think um, the problem is in philanthropy and frankly in governments altogether, we tend to like new shiny things. <laughs> and yeah. in the past we've done it multiple times. So I worked a lot on the international side. So at some point education was the in thing. So all money went from everything else to education. Then it was HIV AIDS. So all money went from education to HIV AIDS. The pot just keeps shifting, but it's the same pot. But I think what one of the things that we have to remember is all of it is necessary at the same time. So there's, there, and Margaret, I think, said it at the beginning, and this is what the Social Innovation Fund did, which is like, there is just grant money that needs to be grant money that's gonna help organizations scale. You need the evidence, you need to get people to be able to get evidence and then help them scale. And that's just gonna remain in the grant pot. Scale is probably gonna come from the government, but philanthropy can certainly help kind of find where the best ideas and where the best options are. There's the, Stuff where capital, where, where kind of it's a hybrid model, where it's a nonprofit that can have a potential for-profit model that helps feed the overhead costs, which is probably the most expensive for most of these organ for most nonprofits to get. And what's that model that needs to exist? I think sometimes it's in partnership with other organizations. Sometimes, frankly, philanthropy needs to help organizations figure out how to build mm -hmm. models that are that have the for-profit pot. And then there's a third, I think, which is the impact investing, impact bonds, where the capital markets can certainly partner with government and philanthropy and really figure out how do you bring markets into helping solve some of these problems. But I don't think they're all the same. And what we tend to conflagrate is all of them into one pot and say, well, philanthropy should just do impact investing and impact bonds, but not do the, not do the grant making or not do the hybrid. It's, it's 
it's an all-encompassing model that needs all three of them because right now the capital market is one or the other. Either you're all private sector or you're all philanthropy, and I think you need some, some bit of all of it. There's a really good report that the Monitor Institute um, published just a couple months ago on the role of philanthropy in impact investing. And, and they, they lay out in very specific ways exactly how, how philanthropy is useful in um, creating the absorptive capacity of you know, doing early studies. Um, it's almost philanthropy is the angel investor um, in, order, in order to mm -hmm. equip organizations and the markets to actually become a sustainable market-based enterprise. I think it might give you some ideas. This is our last question. Hi, my name is Tiffany Lazo and I'm a freshman at the college. And my question is basically that I think it's sometimes argued whether funds going to specific organizations or causes um, from corporations um, create a dependency on the populations it's helping rather than actually producing a social change or addressing a social concern. So I was just wondering what government policies or strategies do you guys believe is important in order to encourage organizations and corporations to fund um, efforts that are driven towards actually helping the people and helping them transform their center of living rather than producing a short-term dependence on funds that is donated? It, that's a really hard question. We did a challenge grant in Michigan of $15 million um, it, to have, uh, we brought government and philanthropy together um, to talk about what they thought, to give us proposals. Um, and in the conversation, we were sitting and talking about Detroit in particular, uh, which is not far from where I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. And um, as they were talking, they started talking about programs over 30, 40 years, working in the same communities, providing resources to different populations, but all low income. And the bubble over my head was just what you're saying, gosh, what's wrong with this picture? Are we providing just enough resources that create some kind of sense of, false sense of opportunity? And I think I don't think we have the answer to that yet. Mm -hmm. um, Detroit is a city that needs to be deconstructed, and there are some very deep and hard decisions that have to be made. And um, I think sometimes ph philanthropy can get in the way of those decisions that need to be taken. I, I would just give one example of how donors can make a huge difference, and that's donations to colleges and universities. I, I actually was surprised to find that the trend towards scholarships in public universities, not just private universities, is toward merit, not need. So we're facing a huge problem with student debt, and our taxpayer dollars for public universities are going to kids of rich folks because their SATs are high. That's wrong. And that's been the trend. And the, I think it's one of the things we're going to see. I happen to be working on student debt, on a project on student debt. But it's all connected. When you, think, when you give your money to your, your college, make sure it's, it's need-based scholarships, not just merit. It can be merit and need. But make sure it's just not merit so that my kid doesn't need a scholarship. He's fine. He was fine. But he was offered one. But he should not have been offered one. And I, and I think that's it. When we talk about education, we talk about a huge student debt, which is bigger than the mortgage debt now. Right. That's where it's coming from, and it's going to get worse. And on that, we did something called performance-based scholarship, which isn't just, it was to entice, uh, it wasn't based on what you did before, it's based on what you're going to do. And you receive the scholarship if you did what you said you were going to do. So I think we have to be innovative. Yep. Yep. And I think uh, the issue of student debt in this country is our really a next tsunami. So I'm going to close, but I'm going to yep. ask you guys, give me a rapid answer to this question. Where can philanthropy be innovative? Where can philanthropy be innovative? Rapid. <laughs> you gotta have like a two second rapid. answer. 
I think be, be, um, be place-based and stick with it. Pretty old-fashioned. Uh, I think place-based is broad. It needs to be a broad term. And I think it's to mm -hmm. take opportunities when they present themselves and to be willing to take a risk, to be willing to, uh, to not be right uh, but to, to take on different challenges and to take on things that aren't comfortable, uh, to take on issues of incarceration, to take on issues of um, our drug laws, to take on things uh, around poverty that uh, other people don't want to touch. And I think it's to, to think about where people are and where they need to go and stop treating like all first graders like they're the same. Uh, or all people right. looking like jobs where they're the same. So you have to put investment in people who need investment, uh, whether it's low socioeconomic kids or formerly incarcerated, not just a program for workforce. So I'm going to close by saying I think, you know, as you hear this conversation, you hear that philanthropy has so many different roles that it plays, whether it's from a corporate foundation, whether it's from a personal foundation or a foundation that's been set up like the Soros Foundation, or even from the historical perspective that Chris is offering, which is where are the trends and what are the trends doing? There's huge opportunity in thinking about how philanthropy can be catalytic, how it can use information, data, uh, knowledge of knowing what's working and what's not working and what more it could be doing. Uh, but frankly, I think a large part of the conversation was around partnerships. How do you create new types of partnerships that can help leverage the dollars that philanthropy has to actually do a lot more and what are the issues that we should be looking at and maybe be a bit more fearless. Um, not be so afraid to take on some of the tough issues that maybe even government doesn't want to talk about or society doesn't want to talk about, but have some fearlessness quality to that where you take on some of those issues because that's what it's going to require if we actually want to solve some problems and not just be here talking about it in another 10 years. So I think these are, these are some of the tougher questions of philanthropy, and, and we didn't get to a lot of them, but I think as you all think about philanthropy and as you think about whether your roles in philanthropy or working with philanthropy, uh, think about how you might push some of those conversations even from your organizations or from the perspectives that you're in, whether it's in academia or whether it's in practice. Uh, it, it requires a Margaret McKenna in a Walmart to ask some of those tough questions. It requires a Mimi Corcoran at the Open Society Institute willing to try new ideas and willing to take on some of the ideas on poverty. And it requires a Chris who's actually going to offer some of the perspectives on the historical. Did it work before? Hasn't it worked before? Have we tried this before? But not looking at history and, and and assuming that history, we're just moving forward because we have better ideas today, well, some of those better ideas were already thought of, and maybe we should be looking back at those ideas and thinking about them differently. So thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, we'll hope these conversations continue.